Hey Val, can you all hear me? Yep, sounds good. Awesome. Hello, everybody. I think I have some issues with my, my I couldn't log in my laptop, but uh, I'm just, uh, I just logged in my mobile phone, cell phone, so. Hello, can you hear me? Can anybody hear me? I can hear you, George. <laughs> I don't okay. know if the people at the university can. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm having some problem with uh, logging into my laptop. Um, yeah. but I don't know. I don't know if it is the same uh, invitation that is uh, given by Shannon on the first day, or maybe the one that is given by Kelly. Uh, I tried both, but uh, it seems both are not working. So I'm just sp speaking from my cell phone. It works on my cell phone, but uh, doesn't actually work on my uh, laptop. Well, it sounds clear, but yeah, they'll probably have to put your slides up for you then, right? Oh yeah, yes. I think that would be uh, uh, that would be great. I think I think it, it will may not be possible for me to actually uh, do it from my laptop. It seems. I couldn't log into my laptop, but uh, cell phone is clear. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds good. Daniel's um, there. There he is. Yeah. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Welcome. Um, Can hear us. And, and um, I want to briefly introduce uh, Kelly, who will uh, introduce this fourth Tuesday presentation. However, today is a very special day. Today is, as declared by the United Nations, the International Day of Education. And so it is, I think, extremely appropriate that on the International Day of Education, we're having this presentation uh, for our fourth Tuesday. So um, welcome. Uh, thank you, especially to our the three presenters from different uh, parts of the world. And uh, Kelly, over to you for the formal introduction. Thank you, Daniel. Um, hi, my name is Kelly Fleming. I'm the um, Chief Academic Officer here at Future Generations University. Um, this, you've joined us on our fourth Tuesday series. It's a webinar series that happens 
on the fourth Tuesday of every month at 11 o'clock Eastern time. That's the, the time zone in the US that, that this office is in. Um, today, we're gonna be sharing uh, three student projects, um, independent projects that they had been working on. Two of them are still students and, and one of them is actually graduated from the program. I really wanted them to share both um, a little bit about their journey in, in the academic program here at Future Generations, how they got interested in this specific um, independent project, how that went, and, and sort of where that's going for them. So um, there's going to be three of them. I'm going to start with Alexis Jenkin, who is in Arizona. And I'm pretty sure, she, go ahead, Alexis, if you want to. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> All right, I'm going to share my screen. Can you see that okay? Yes, looks great. Go ahead. Excellent. Hello, everyone. My name is Alexis Jenkin. Thank you so much for your interest in the Independent Study Program and I project today. I will be speaking upon conservation education in Arizona. I specifically work in the Phoenix metro area, which is the fifth largest city in the United States and has a population of about 5 million. And I work for the Arizona Department of Transportation, which is a public agency that implements all our transportation projects in the Valley and in the state. Some introductions to the program and why I got started in the independent study project. I think environmental conservation often entails pulling at people's heartstrings or on the opposite end, pulling out our federal and state regulations and saying, you have to do this. So on our agency level, when I work in the field, I find that our regulations are boiled down into one or two sentences about the environmental issues that are present. And it doesn't really dis disclose a lot about what conservation looks like in the field and for our field personnel. So if you can see on the right, I have the Chuck Walla picture, and this is a local lizard that has an orange tail that is very specific to the project we were working in. And they spent months and months um, relocating this lizard from our project area because Chuck Wallace have this nasty habit of not fleeing from danger and rather sticking in the rocks and trying to wait it out. And that doesn't really work for our projects. So when we have this project site open up, they've done all this work, but our field workers have no idea what the, what this happened, how long it took. And then also we have a lot of mitigation measures implemented to make sure these animals don't get back on our project site while we're working and get in danger once more. So I really wanted my independent study project to implement a approachable resource that everyone can understand what our environmental programs look like and improve that in our short and long term. So I had a really great team for my independent study. From future generations, I worked with Dr. Naomi Bates and attended her class about geographic information systems. And she really assisted in, I did the project for the class and that really kickstarted the idea of how I could make this a larger database and a larger mapping system. And then Kelly Fleming helped me take the project to the end. And they both really gave me the objectives for the independent study and helped me design the project. And then my direct advisor at the Department of Transportation um, really brought the experience of ADOT construction and landscape projects and how that policy is actually drafted. So I got a good team working with me. Specifically, my community has about 300 people. They're crew members, engineers, managers, analysts, admins, et cetera. And they all have different levels of education and experience, especially with environmental concepts. So I wanted to appeal to a lot of different educational ranges and make this resource really approachable. I also wanted to showcase our mission as a public agency, uh, which is to increase the efficiency and overall condition of the roadway, um, as well as just increase safety for ourselves and the public and environmental concepts very much tie into safety issues. So I used geographic information systems by creating a series of maps um, through ArcGIS Online. 
And then I also incorporated story maps to give people the experience. So the map on the left is a map I actually pulled from our state agency about air quality. And looking at it, you really wouldn't know what's going on. So there are a little bit more resources in the map that I'm not showing, but I really wanted the story map component to show what all these definitions they may need, how the mapping incorporates into the bigger picture of the Phoenix Valley and air pollution in this case. So for the final project, I incorporated this into a Google website, which is how our agency implements changes and also allowed me to reach 300 people pretty easily. So anyone that comes on as an employee or is working as a supervisor can access this page and go into the training materials, which is where I have my story maps and go through each concept. So there's water quality, hazardous waste, and one about biological species, which allowed me to incorporate a lot of media, videos, maps, et cetera. The water quality one, for example, has lots of definitions about what a watershed is and how water travels into our valley and then out again, and how that journey influences our drinking water and safety in that way. It then dials down into the work we do and how our work can introduce pollutants into the stormwater system, and then how we track that and mitigate those impacts with stormwater basins and other concepts in the valley. So once someone's gone through the story map and fully understands the concepts, they can move into the environmental review tools. The environmental review tools I designed mainly for project supervisors. So they can go in looking at what type of work they're doing and it lists out all the different environmental issues that are applicable. They can identify what resource might apply based on the work that they're doing and then go into the link in the blue, which will link to a map that has permit information and whatever information I could find in the form of GIS. So for example, this one is specifically related to work in waterways. In Arizona, a lot of our rivers are dry most of the year. So that's why we call it a wash. Um, and they can click on a wash and it'll show what river that connects to, and what watershed. So the Gila River travels through the valley and almost to Mexico. So by listing the water name and the watershed, it shows the bigger picture as well as connects it to something they're really familiar with in their area. And then it says, this is a regulated waterway. Please contact your DEC, which is me. <laughs> and then that links out to all the other uh, maps we have. I did another one that's biology. We'll pull that up. Um, that lists all the different ranges and local animals we have, like the chuck walla, or specifically ones that are endangered. So they can go in and click on an area and see what animal relates to that. So this is the Mexican spotted owl range. And then they can go into the story map and view a video about what actually that animal is and how we protect it. So moving in to just lessons learned and takeaways, I would encourage anyone to consider an independent study project because it allows you to bring together all your coursework to that point and under the guidance of advisors, turn that into a really polished portfolio that showcases what you've learned, but also is buildable going forward. I also was really surprised at how, I thought I understood seed scale, but really designing a project and taking it to the end over a year long process really allowed me to understand it, but then also to share that concept with my supervisors who got really excited about recognizing that our field personnel and our population in that way is really influencing change on a state and federal level. So I will continue to use these mapping resources. I think ever, any class I take at future generations, I could build upon what I did here. So I'm very excited to see where it goes in the future. And I thank you for listening to my presentation.
Thank you, Thank Alexis. You. So we have a couple of minutes. Um, if we have any questions, if you have questions um, online, you can put them in the chat um, or the Q&A box that's there. I, Daniel, did you have? Your... I, I just wanted to join in thanking Alexis. I mean, to my mind, and I'm looking forward to the next presentations, Future Generations University is all about, it's all about localizing your learning. And Alexis, you've done exactly that. I just want to say, as the president of the university, I'm really proud of how you localized this theoretical and con concepts that you got in the classes with this independent study. This is um, this is a real tribute to what we're trying to do as a university. So thank you. Thank you. Great, Alexis. So I just wanted to know um, what is going to. So you're going to be continuing to build on this tool. Uh, how else is it being used in your in the community? Have you gotten any feedback from community members about what the next iteration of it should include or should focus on? Yeah, so the next step probably, well, I'm going to be doing a lot of trainings, but a lot of my personnel that I've used it to this point have um, really wanted more of a feedback section. So I have some stuff that they'll inspect or look at, and they did a survey, one, two, three survey, where they can actually put in real time what they found and then connect that to what I have in the maps. So we'll be tracking what work we're actually doing in the field. That's great. Yes. One, two, three survey is a great tool. It's called that, right? Um, yeah. It's really one, two, three. And it's yeah. really flexible. Like it can just be on your phone or computer. So they don't need like licensing or anything like that. Right. Just awesome. Well, I don't see a question coming through and we can circle back if people have something that comes to them um, during the next presentations. So next we have uh, Saring Dor. Oh, Joey has raised his hand. Joey, go ahead. If, if I get the okay that you can talk. We're getting there. His questions in the Q and A. Yep. Oh, okay. Go ahead, Joey, if you can talk. Yeah, perfect. Ooh, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah, I also asked this question in the Q&A box. But Alexis, I'm just, this really kind of feels like a storytelling project to me. Um, and and I think that's neat um, because it did involve GIS so heavily and I don't usually think of that as a storytelling tool. So do you want to talk a little bit about the relation um, that you discovered or or used uh, GIS to do storytelling? Yeah, absolutely. I love st telling stories through maps. That's one of my really big passions. And I think when you have a kind of complex topic like environmental issues and water quality, and you're not really able to visualize how your small action is impacting a really big scope, um, maps kind of take it down into how locally it applies to you. So that makes it more relatable. And then you can use maps like the storytelling through story maps, which is really, if you haven't done it before, I really recommend it. It allows you to attach more information, kind of guide that story through each map and show, um, introduce the topic and then carry it through to the bigger picture, which I really enjoyed about this project. Thank you. Awesome. So we're going to move on to Staring Dorji's presentation. And I think we did, of course, trial this yesterday and it all worked perfectly, but as technology likes to do, it throws you a curveball every now and then. So I think Heather's going to share the slides and Saring's going to talk from his office in Bhutan. There we go, a cross-cultural experience right here. Saring, do you want to start talking so we can make sure we can hear you? Oh, yes. Uh, uh... I can hear you now. I think now the the my laptop. I think I could log into my login. I mean laptop. So so. Okay. Uh, Would you like okay. us to? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Are you ready, or do you want me to let Valerie go first? So you uh, can... let me see if I can share my screen there. Okay. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Oh, that's great. <laughs> okay, so uh, good evening from Bhutan, and uh, especially uh, I would like to uh, say good evening to uh, Dr. Daniel. Uh, 
it's long time since we have been uh, yeah we have actually uh, communicated and uh, it's nice to see everybody at future generations and uh, i think uh, i'm just looking forward to actually uh, talking to you up maybe after i have presented that maybe that, that's that would be a good idea well my presentation actually uh, does not have a, a, i didn't actually follow a format because uh, earlier when i did my independent study uh, uh, I actually did, uh, I think I remember doing it uh, uh, on a, uh, yeah, I was just doing on a the model of story saving, but then unfortunately, I also actually uh, communicated it to uh, uh, Professor Naomi Bates, Bates and uh, uh, Chris that uh, I, for, I actually lost all my documents with future generations and I was just requesting them if they can send me any correspondences that I had uh, future generations. And so Chris was uh, kind enough to send me some of the communications that we had, but then I had actually, I lost uh, almost all my uh, my documents uh, with it. Well, however, uh, I did actually try to uh, make a presentation so that uh, although I have uh, uh, graduated uh, maybe one and a half year ago, but uh, I still uh, is uh, I'm still very much part of the future generations. Okay, and uh, my name is uh, Sering Doji, and uh, by profession I'm the chief of the administration and finance uh, uh, division of this organization, and the organization is called the Royal Society for Protection of Nature. Uh, however, my interest in the conservation um, generated from my close association with the organization and uh, as also as partial fulfillment of my master's, I've been doing an internship with the uh, white bellied heron project in my organization. And this has actually triggered my passion in the conservation of the, the uh, particular project. And yes, uh, now white belly heron, I just wanted to relate white belly heron conservation and community livelihood and uh, Well, the objective uh, was, uh, I just wanted to understand critical components of the ecology, but it was very difficult within the short span, of, it was very difficult to understand the whole ecology of the white belly heron. So some critical components of uh, the white belly heron. I also wanted to relate the community livelihood and white belly heron conservation to these two, because uh, we believe, we in RSP, we believe that uh, Communities are the center of the conservation of the white belly heron, or like any any species uh, that we uh, focus on. So that's one thing, and also to identify community livelihood opportunities uh, that uh, is beneficial to the white belly heron. So uh, these are some of the things that I have looked at. Okay, we look at this uh, history of the white belly heron. This is uh, uh, just for people who may not. And know this species. This is, I think, uh, uh, very endemic to Himalayan freshwater ecosystem, South Asia. These are some of the history of this bird. This today, if you we talk about this, is a very critically endangered species. There are, I think, uh, globally, globally, there are less than sixty, and uh, Bhutan actually hosts around fifty percent of the total population of the, this. So that's why we had to look at some of the uh, history where it was uh, went extinct and. Uh, you know, uh, the kind of uh, the distributions across uh, uh, the, the, the globe. So these, these were the things that we had to look at. So uh, firstly, as I said, it was endemic to Himalayan freshwater systems. It was very rare and elusive, predominantly occupying natural wetlands. These are, I think, these are the habitats uh, they cover. And uh, they distributed across Indian subcontinent earlier, uh, prior to 1950, but they are now extinct from Nepal, they are not observed in uh, Bangladesh for the past 50 years. And uh, the potential presence in Bhutan was actually realized only in 1890s from there. So they are popular among bird watchers and tourists during 1990s. That was, but then not much study was done on this, uh, this species. And uh, earlier locals used to even perceive it as bad. I mean, if you have seen a white belly run, which is not the case now, but of course, there are no social cultural uh, associations. If you look at the nests, they have a breeding. When you talk about nests, we are also talking about the breeding pairs, which is very important for the population to increase. So uh, 
maybe around 1890, they have observed it in Darjeeling, uh, in the Northern India. In 1930, they have uh, observed in uh, Myanmar. In 2014, they have observed one nest in India. But from 2003 to 2023, we had around, uh, initially we had around uh, five nest, active nests in uh, Bhutan. Now we have, as of uh, 2023, we have three active nests uh, in Bhutan. If you look at the, uh, the, the distribution, it's just in Bhutan, if you have seen, there are also in India, but not much, around five or six uh, individuals found in there. But of course, they are in Myanmar. It's very important, very difficult for us to actually get the information from Myanmar because of uh, some civil wars there. So it was very difficult. We are not expecting much there. But uh, other than that, uh, as I uh, said earlier, we had, uh, Bhutan has around, uh, as of 2023, we had around 23 individuals in Bhutan. But other than that, we have few in India. Uh, our population census was done only in Bhutan. So we didn't actually have access to other parts of the uh, uh, range. In Bhutan, we have also looked at the, 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 if you look at the, on the map, we have looked at all the potential habitats of this bird while we did the total, uh, the uh, population census. And they are actually uh, concentrated to this uh, river, two rivers. One is the Mangdechu, and the one, one is the uh, Punatang Shui, and then its tributaries. So even the active nets are uh, on these uh, two rivers and others were actually, they are potential habitats, but then not much uh, individuals were actually uh, observed in those areas. Now, if you look at the conservation of white billed heron in Bhutan, the first project in 2003, we have started with maybe circulating some, some, some all kinds of awareness programs, not much done on research and all, but uh, we had uh, just, there were few sightings of the nest, but other than that, uh, some pictures and postings, that were some uh, advocacies and educations done in, uh, in the communities. But uh, I think the first active nest discovered in Bhutan was in 2003 at a place called Sawai, which is in central Bhutan. And the rediscovery of the world after 70 years of earlier unknown, earlier non record, because earlier it uh, was said that uh, globally people have declared that the white belly heron was extinct uh, from the world. But then when we have actually uh, discovered that in 2003, it, it was actually the rediscovery of the world, uh, of the uh, species in the world after 70 years of the earlier non record. So over the two decades of cataloging species, we had some mapping distributions, we have habitat protection and restoration. Those are the small, small kinds of uh, conservations that we have done. We have read the population trend. We have also studied the nest and breeding populations. We have done some public awareness. We have supported the communities and we have also uh, to a large extent, we have engaged them in our conservation efforts. And there were a few research and information. Uh, we still have to do a lot of researches uh, on this uh, species. And then uh, we are also now doing a, a conservation of a breeding program. So that's what uh, one important uh, aspect of the conservation of this uh, bird. Oh. Now, if you look at this, this is the population from uh, 2003 until 2022 and uh, last year, which was 23. So if you look at uh, the population from 14 in 2003 to 23 and 22, there is no significant, uh, you know, uh, increase in the population or uh, decrease, but uh, it just remains stable. So we need to actually, when, we, the, when the population remains stable, I think this is also a sign of danger because uh, at any time, if the population goes down or there are any uh, cases of diseases, then we are likely to lose the whole population uh, to the disease. 
this is a study done on uh, how the habitat, the population, whole population of white valley heron, where, uh, so we have actually, uh, if you look at the zones, we have divided them into zones and then in, on the zones, uh, the whole country into zones and where, where the uh, white valley heron uh, active before and how do they actually move towards new zones or maybe because of there are numerous decisions because that could be because of uh, habitat loss, because of uh, human disturbances, because of recreational activities, because of extraction of natural resources by human. So there are a lot of, uh, you know, uh, a lot of uh, issues which could actually, which would have actually uh, uh, moved the white bear heron from its earlier habitat to new habitat. So these are uh, some of the distributions that you see and uh, how they have moved from one zone to another on how the, the population in one zone has decreased and the other in the, whereas in the other zone it has uh, increased. So these are uh, some of the patterns of their movement. If you have look at this, uh, these are some of the community uh, engagements that we do. So we believe in educating or empowering the local communities because they are the central. Bhutan, if you look at Bhutan has uh, around uh, 60, more than 60% of the people live in the forest in Bhutan. They are the people who are living in the forest. And then they are the people who are living next to the white bullet around habitats. So unless we take care of their livelihoods uh, or their comfort zone, we cannot actually, the conservation of the white bellied heron is uh, not possible. So these are some of the pictures that we have done. Some, uh, we can also see some of uh, livelihood activities that we like. The one that I could include here is a fish tank that we have provided to uh, the local communities there. We have also some educational programs that happened and some field activities. So these are some of the things that I try to include. Now, what are the interventions that we have? Uh, RSPN has done as an organization. We have actually established a captive breeding center to increase the population and save a gene pool. So if, as I said, if the population goes extinct from the wild because of some mishaps or some uh, disasters, like uh, diseases or like that. We need to have a gene pool uh, in captive because there are some species in the world which were actually successful in, uh, again, reintroducing to the world after it was about to be extinct, like the white belly heron. Uh, like uh, if you talk about, I think, uh, if you look at another one type of crane, which is called the uh, Soros crane, was introduced in Thailand. They have uh, actually increase the population. Now I think they have more than a thousand species, thousand uh, numbers in the, the bowl. So I think these are some of the, uh, you know, the positive uh, experiences that uh, other countries have done. So we have, for the first time in Bhutan, we have actually uh, established a white belly, white belly heron uh, captive breeding center, and uh, this is first of its kind uh, globally. The community is the center of the white village conservation, as I said, so that's why, firstly, the, uh, we look at the uh, needs of the uh, communities and uh, at the communities are actually being educated, they were being trained to actually, uh, uh, actually observe the white belly herons to report any sightings or these are some of the things that we have done. They are given the livelihood opportunities such as fish ponds, poultry, horticulture, piggery, etc., to uplift their living standards. One important uh, aspect of this is the local community, local actually it's local conservation support group, that is the uh, LCSG, is selected amongst the community members and they are paid actually allowances on a half yearly basis or minimal fee to them. So they are the ones who are actually reporting, they who are actually helping us to do the surveys. And, uh, you know, they, as I said, told earlier, they also report to us through uh, uh, 
uh, app called EpiCollect. And then whenever they cite a white wallet somewhere, they actually send it to us. And so that we know that white wallet uh, sightings and uh, the habitats that uh, want to use. So these are some of the things uh, that we there's also another group of people who are called a resource group. They are selected from the uh, partner organizations like Department of For, uh, Forest and Park Services. And they pay daily sustenance allowance. Actually, we pay them at least five days in a month. We pay them a daily sustenance allowance. And these are also the people who will help us educate the communities uh, within the white bellied heron uh, habitat. Then other than that, we have also ecotourism which is another perk for the communities living in the white belly heron uh, habitat, where eco trails, homestays are developed uh, to attract local and international tourists and birders. And the support groups uh, report sightings, nestings, and any information to RSPM by using the Epicolic app. This has helped RSPM educate uh, and train the local community in the conservation of the bird. This is the white belly heron conservation, uh, conservation facility. As you see, this is half finished. Uh, there are still a lot of construction going on. There are two large uh, alveries here, they, which can actually, each can, each has the capacity to uh, raise around 10 birds each. But uh, as of now, we have only three in captivity, which are uh, uh, collected from the wild, but then you will also see there is uh, this the the half finished one is a, a veterinary center, it's a rehab center. We have uh, one here which is also uh, is now completed. This is the uh, information and exhibition center. We have the staff quarters, and then there are also we are in the process of building five avenues this side, this side. So uh, our plan is to. So these are some of the birds that you see in the captivity. These are uh, the two that we have. So we have actually an artificial incubation of the heron was piloted uh, with two eggs in 2011. It, this was a long time ago, but in a uh, temporary hut, makeshift hut. But with the success of the hatching of the chick, which flies after 73 days, we have been seeking funds to establish a permanent captive breeding center from the two hydropower projects, which are also on the same habitat, uh, the Panatanchu River Basin. And uh, there are two major hydropower projects. So they have actually helped us uh, establish this community's uh, uh, captive breeding center. The White Belly Heron Center was developed to uh, the present state, uh, the big one, and, uh, with funds from the two hydro projects. This is uh, uh, some of the, these are some of the livelihood, but we also, I was just trying to find some because other activities like poultry and fishery, and we also had some horticulture projects which were uh, actually supported by RSPIN for those communities uh, living in the White Valley Heron uh, habitat. So that these people do not become the compete, uh, you know, the competitive for the white whale heron for the uh, fishes and all. There are also threats. Normally, uh, threats which are actually one is increasing human disturbances, and then we have uh, casualties due to overhead power cables. We have few cases of uh, casualties there. And there are also lots of feeding sites due to developmental activities like hydropower projects and building, you know, concrete buildings and also these are uh, some of the uh, threats. Also predation from monkeys and other wild animals because uh, monkeys in some cases, I think uh, we have observed that monkeys have stolen around five eggs of a breeding pair last year, which was, uh, very sad. And now we have actually uh, put uh, the CCTV cameras there, but then, you know, unless somebody stays there near the nest, guiding that is not going to help. And if you do that, herons will not uh, actually nest there anymore. So, which is a very difficult case. And there are also recreational cases like uh, activities like people have, the tourism department has uh, rafting activities for the tourists which actually happens during the day when the herons are feeding 
And these are uh, some of the reasons why they have moved from uh, some habitats to the other one, others. So uh, these are some of the things. And way forward, we have rigorously looked for uh, suitable habitats to release the adult herons from the captivity. Now we are saying we will at least try to raise 50 birds in captivity, at least, which is more than the, the population we have now. So we wanted to raise that much in captivity and release them in the wild once they reach that capacity. And uh, for that, we need to have uh, new habitats, uh, which are different from the ones they are using now because the ones that are using are already being disturbed. And we'll continue community engagement in the conservation of the bird. We will seek funds to carry out more research on the uh, white belly heron. And we will add more structures at the captive breeding facility to accommodate the uh, target number. And of course, we need to also build the capacity of the staff at the facility, especially in bird handling and increase the number of the local community support group members in all the habitats of the white pellet on. Thank you. So that's all. That's all I have to uh, present. Chairing, uh, this is Daniel. Um, I am thrilled with your presentation. And friends, uh, I have a particular affection for Bhutan. I must be Candid, I first visited in 1961. And the, one of the truly exciting things that I have noticed now over, I guess that's 70 years ago, or no, 60 years, uh, is how the Bhutan, through such efforts as we've just heard from sharing, has protected its very special ecology. And uh, this is an example I'm thrilled to see. Uh, independent project at Future Generations University engaging in this systematic way. We do have limited time, um, so for, uh, I'm sure many people uh, who are on this uh, call um, are, have many questions. Uh, for instance, Hari, I noticed you're on this uh, meeting and the birds of the Himalaya are a special love for you, but let's move on now to the third presentation. And um, so with great pleasure, um, Valerie, it's um, welcoming you. Thanks, Daniel. Hi, everybody. It is evening time here. I uh, hope everyone had a good time in India. I'm very jealous. <laughs> All right. Does that look good? We see it. Great. Thanks. Okay. So my name is Valerie Morgan. I'm a second year master's student at FGU. And my independent project was an internship with an organization called the Chronic Disease Health Alliance, who is focusing on improving health outcomes for underserved neighborhoods in Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh is where I call home. It's a beautiful and diverse post-industrial city in Western Pennsylvania, though it still struggles from the collapse of the steel industry and inequality between its neighborhoods. Uh, but currently, I'm serving as a Peace Corps response volunteer in Western Kenya, working with a local community-based organization called Pomoja. I really love the name Pomoja because it means together in Kiswahili. And as I've learned through my studies, the only real effective community development happens when people work together. So we're collaborating on projects around youth empowerment, prevention of HIV, and household economic strengthening. It's been a real pleasure to be here in Kenya for the first three months of my 12-month stint. It's actually my third Peace Corps service in Africa, and I don't think it'll be my last. Um, so I was fortunate enough to find future generations through the Peace Corps website back in 2020, and I'm honored to be a Coverdell Fellow at FGU. So I never thought uh, it would be possible to find a graduate school that uh, fit me so perfectly. My time at FGU has been the most applicable and inspiring of my life. 
being surrounded by classmates, staff, and faculty who are all making a concerted effort to improve the world has been such a positive and encouraging atmosphere to learn and grow in. I'm constantly inspired by the endeavors of my FGU family. Um, so I was lucky enough to meet and interact with some of these folks on the Appalachian Residential, which was a really fantastic experience. And I also have the pleasure of having a classmate nearby in Pittsburgh to collaborate and commiserate with. Shout out to Robert. So through uh, my work in the seed scale courses, uh, my community and I were working to address local food insecurity and health issues by connecting gardening and composting with cooking and nutrition education. Through this work, I was introduced to a new nonprofit called the Chronic Disease Health Alliance, whose goals were very similar to ours. Their mission is to improve the health outcomes of underserved neighborhoods in our city to, uh, by increasing access to healthy food, nutrition and cooking education, and evidence-based behavior change programs specifically for those at risk or suffering from chronic diseases like type 2 diabetes. The president of their board was really eager to help in our community project, so I decided to ask him if he needed any help in return. So that's how we identified that I could assist in grant writing for CDHA, and uh, so we made that into an internship, and I was able to gain valuable experience in the development sector. So this independent project allowed me to be guided through the many aspects of obtaining funding in my local context um, with individuals who have many years of experience and have had plenty of success in this realm. So we worked together to compile the previous programming that CDHA had been engaged in for proof of impact, along with future goals and programming that they would like to institute. Uh, there was a lot of research involved in finding appropriate grant opportunities, uh, but many of those were outside the window of accepting applications. So I also worked to draft letters of inquiry to get the organization on the radar of local funders. So this internship allowed me to make a great connection between CDHA and my employer at the time, the Greater Pittsburgh Community Food Bank because they were looking to create innovative partnerships with other food security organizations in our community. Um, I gained a lot of knowledge on fiscal sponsorship for nonprofits. Um, that was a new concept to me. So I was helping to complete the application for fiscal sponsorship as I completed my internship in November. And then I handed over the reins to some new interns. I was also happy to help create a tracking system to document the organization's details and grant opportunities, past, present, and future. So this tool will eliminate them having to search for the same information over and over as they get new members and interns to help with their cause. One of the biggest challenges we came across in applying for funding was the lack of name recognition, um, having current funders and historical impacts since CDHA is so new. I of course wish I had had more time to help before leaving for Kenya, but I know that the dedicated members of CDHA will overcome the hurdles <clears throat> through their networks and their commitment to the mission. And I know I will continue to benefit from having these individuals in my network now. Uh, lastly, I did an analysis of the organization under a seed scale lens using the principles and criteria to examine successes and challenges faced by CDHA. So two examples of my findings would be the, the three-way partnership needs strengthening. This organization is an alliance between various health-focused partners acting from the outside in. So they really need to focus on a greater presence of bottom-up input 
input from the people in the neighborhoods of focus, as well as more connections with what I feel is an enabling government body in the city of Pittsburgh. So also um, evidence-based decision-making is strong. Uh, the amount of data available about food insecurity and health issues in Pittsburgh is plentiful. And CDHA is also enacting EBIs, evidence-based interventions, which are proven to be effective behavior change methods. As my artifact of completing this independent project, I compiled an outline of my work in an e-portfolio on Padlet. Um, so I included my accomplishments, some examples of my research, writing, and spreadsheet documentation, the seed scale analysis findings, a letter of recommendation from the president of the board, and then my conclusions on the internship. I think it's really important to have this visual representation of my experience available for future use. Um, so we are encouraged to do this uh, for every class that we're in, and I really think it's been helpful to be able to go back and look at my work um, from any class at any time. Uh, so I highly encourage other students to take advantage of the opportunity to do an independent project and get hands-on experience in your area of interest and learn from dedicated professionals. Uh, even though grant writing is not my passion, I know that this is a crucial part of community development work. So this internship was extremely beneficial to my future career. So for any new students or international students, I just wanted you to know that uh, the beautiful North Mountain campus is a real place. Uh, I've seen it with my own eyes and it's worth the trip. So especially to go and meet the magical people who work there. So thank you so much for listening and let me know if you have any questions. In Kiswahili, Asante Sana Kuna Swali. Thank you so much, Valerie. And there is a round of applause in the room for all three um, presentations that we've had. It's a little hard to catch, catch that on one mic, but um, uh, I see a Q&A, but I can't read it from here. So let me <laughs> let me give everybody online a chance to, to think up if there's any uh, follow-up questions they had for Val. Um, I appreciate the way that you can you combine all those different parts of, of, of your experience within the program and and your life outside. So that's been that's been inspirational even to me to, to know that we're reaching far the far reaches we we bring our program. So was there sorry is there no it's all good ah sweet okay sure luke has a question uh hey val good to see you um glad to hear kenya's going well um i and i think i may have the order on this wrong so uh let me know if i do but i guess my question is i'm pretty sure i'm assuming that you were able to take like the fundraising course and some of those so you're able to take official coursework prior to doing your internship and i'm just kind of interested about um kind of what that experience was like of kind of having first kind of being you know with a course you normally get introduced to a lot of ideas but then being able to really kind of like go and do a several month long lab where you take the parts you want to and really jump into them can you talk about that at all sure um so i actually opted to um not take the fundraising course because of uh, fitting it into my uh, schedule before graduating, but instead to find uh, really experienced individuals in my community that could guide me through grant writing since they were really engaged in it as they started their nonprofit up. Cool. So I guess the answer to my question is scheduling didn't allow you to take a course, so you did an internship to make up for it. <laughs> yes, exactly. Awesome. Also very cool. Was there any other questions? Yeah, and um, I did sort of have a question for Tsering about, be, um, I really appreciated your ability to share this with us. I didn't know if you've been able to share the story of the white belly heron 
with other, like what other groups have you been able to sort of present to on this work? Uh, well, in, initially when I did this, uh, I did this with uh, uh, Dr. Naomi and also the my mentor here, Mr. Indra Pasat Acharya. Uh, he is today, not, uh, I actually tried to invite him today uh, for this, but I think he's on a very important project in the central part of Bhutan and he won't be able to actually, he couldn't join us today. But otherwise, yes, and also a group of the 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 people who are to do with this uh, white bullet heron project. So, uh, I did, last time I did uh, when I did present it to uh, Professor Naomi, I think yeah, Indra was there, and the whole group of people who are uh, the project officers for this uh, white bullet heron project were there. Um, for everybody who's participating, uh, and I see a number of people on the line, and we have uh, a dozen people here in the world room uh, at Future Generations, and um, Val, nice to see the pictures here on the campus, but I want everybody else to know we got snow outside um, here, but I, for those of you who are attending this presentation as students, the whole use of independent projects now is a growing feature of the university and i want to encourage anybody who's at all interested uh, to contact chris roper and explore how to set one up because the key in setting up an independent project in my experience is to be very clear as to what you can get done in the amount of time and how you can use the faculty here and advisors who are not faculty, but who are expert in the field um, to help your project. And in all the examples that we've had here, the three great examples, we have had shown a blending of mentors who are um, both future generations faculty and external ones. So uh, we have scheduled this fourth Tuesday uh, presentation to um, try to highlight this aspect of our academic program uh, of independent studies because the degree at Future Generations is applied community development. And the independent project option is particularly good for that. And here in the presentations that we've had today are three examples of that. I would like to turn it back to the three presenters here. We have a few minutes left in case each of them wants to give some advice to other students who might be interested in the independent study option what was uh, what advice would you have um sharing or val or um or alexis to other students who might be interested in doing an independent study and just jump in if you have i won't uh, uh, any of you might be interested in commenting Uh, okay. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I would like to uh, say some of my views, uh, uh, like when I did this independent study. As I said earlier, I'm not a, a project officer. Or I'm not a white belly heron conservationist uh, by profession. I am uh, uh, administrative and finance uh, personnel. But when I took this study, th this master's, mm -hmm. I think uh, uh, Initially, I, I was very skeptical. I was just worrying uh, how things will go. But then as it went on, I think uh, you had a lot of options. I think I was given a lot of guidance. I think the future generation, everybody in future generation was very open to questions and, uh, you know, the doubts that we had, we had clarified, being clarified by the uh, professors there. So uh, I would suggest uh, Anybody, as the uh, professor was saying, I think uh, any student there, I think it's worthwhile to do an independent study. Because most of the time people will not uh, take the risk of doing that independent study. But I think by doing this, I have uh, acquired a lot of knowledge in the conservation of the white bear. And now I am more conscious about, uh, although I deal with uh, money and administration in the organization, but then I'm more conscious of the conservation of the species, not uh, limited to white bellied heron, but also the black neck crane, uh, which is another flagship species for our organization. So uh, the, the I understand how it works to conserve a species. And uh, as I said earlier, uh, because of my studies at the future generations, I also uh, understand that without the uh, engagement of the communities, 
very important in the communities, uh, the conservations are not uh, possible. So I would suggest everybody to take that, uh, uh, I mean, do an independent study and then get the in-depth of uh, what you are doing. I think this is more, uh, uh, more fruitful than, as I said earlier, more fruitful than reading somebody's uh, uh, writings. Do it yourself and uh, find it yourself. I think this is more important. Thank you. Thank you, Chairing. Uh, Val or Alexis, would you care to comment on the importance in the of the independent study option? Yeah, I think my only comment would be that I find often a class is so interesting and exciting, like I took strategic communications and we went through a whole project. And if you see like something like that in a course where you want to take it to the next step, I think there's a lot of open-mindedness amongst the professors and our staff that uh, you can do that in, in the form of an independent study. And that's what I did. So I think that's a good step into it as well. And um, for me, uh, I decided to focus on my weaknesses for the independent project, which would be like networking and the actual grant writing itself. So I was able to expand my network in a really beneficial way by meeting um, all the people involved in this new nonprofit. So when I get back to Pittsburgh, um, I'll be in a really good place to start a career. Great. Um, I want to thank again the three presenters and um, for for <laughs> stepping up and, and presenting something that you've been working on. And, and we really appreciate it. I want to thank the people here on North Mountain for coming to the fourth Tuesdays and especially those um, joining us online. Um, as Daniel said, this we do encourage students to consider an independent study. There is an independent study form that you that kind of helps you walk through the different stages of the process. Um, those can kind of start whenever you want. Um, so they don't technically have to fall within the semester structure. Um, what, uh, there was some other thing, but um, I'm just, and they don't, thank you, Chris. Chris is reminding me that they don't have to end at the end of the semester either, because although courses, as Daniel said, we're trying to fit things into, uh, you know, a, an eight, a 16 week um, block, the independent studies can be longer or shorter. So um, we encourage you to get in touch. Thank you to all those people that are out there um, joining us remotely. Um, I wish we could all be in the same room together, but unfortunately some of us have to be in Kenya and Bhutan and Phoenix. Uh, so thank you all for being here and um, we'll see you next month. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Thanks, see you guys.